right, thank you. So, um, so this is joint work with Jochen, Kostya, Prabhi, Swami, and Yitz. Uh, and I wanted to talk about this since it started um, during the trimester program here. Um, so it's on the prize collecting stand of forest problems. So just uh, to remind us also, I see that the normal stand of forest problem, uh, we're given a non directed graph, cost on the edges, and then a bunch of terminal pairs S1, T1, S2, T2, and so on. And all we want to do is you know, buy a subset of edges of this graph that collect all, that connect all of the terminal pairs at minimum cost. Okay? So that's stand of forest, and if all of the Ti's are say the same, this would be sine of 3. And then what is the prize collecting version? So same thing except <coughs> we have the option of not connecting all of these terminals. We can instead pay some, some penalty pi i for not connecting pair i. So that the prize that we win is not going to pay penalty. Um, so uh, so, yeah. so in this example, we might not connect S3 and T. And then PC, ST will be price collecting Steiner tree. Uh, same thing, but all the terminals are, the TIs are the same. OK. Um, so what is known for, oh, so, and then uh, there's a very natural LP for this problem. So just the cut LP. So basically, we'll have YI for whether I buy the edge or not. And I'll have zi, which is 1 if I don't connect terminal pair i. Okay, so if I do connect terminal pair i, then I shouldn't have, you know, every clap separating si and ti I should then have value at least 1 in the set of edges that we buy. So natural LP. Um, <coughs> so what do we know? So firstly, uh, okay, so the numbers in blue here are going to be relative to this uh, basic cut LP. <coughs> um, so if we just have no prizes and just uh, just the Steiner tree problem, so the cut LP still has a, an integrality gap of, of two. Okay, so even just in this case here, of course, uh, Boca et al. showed how to do this is the best result, uh, which uses a different and you know, much stronger LP. But for the cut LP, so it's just two. That's tight. Um, Steiner Forest, that's also uh, two, and again, of course, that's tight. And uh, for prize collecting Steiner Tree, again, we're relative to this cut LP, one can get two. It's slightly better, um, but again, not relative to this LP. Um, but if we look at prize collecting Steiner Forest, then the best that was is known as uh, worse, 2.54 by Ajega and Jing. So it's sort of a pretty natural question of whether we can improve this 2.54 to 2. Um, but let's say it was sort of a, a folklore belief that this should be possible, and in particular that the cat LP would still have an integrality gap of 2 in this case. And so so we show this is not the case. Uh, so this, uh, so with respect to this uh, cut LP, you cannot do better than 2.25. Um, so I want to explain, I mean, it's you know, essentially just a, a construction. Um, but I think it's kind of a nice construction. And somehow my feeling is uh, we don't really have very good tools for uh, constructing lower bound examples for a lot of these problems. I mean, also for like, you know, the Steiner tree, I mean, okay, for the for this particular LP, it's, we know it's two, and that's pretty straightforward, but I mean, the stronger LPs, uh, the lower bound examples that we have, we don't have a sense that you know, these are the best ones. They're probably not, and we don't really seem to have good ways of, uh, sort of, good languages to, to talk about them and improve them. Um, okay, so so actually, so let me just go back to Steiner Forest first um, and <coughs> talk about uh, something quite nice there. So, so 
Suppose I take some solution to the Steiner forest of B, not price collecting, just normal Steiner forest. And I blow it up to make it integers. I just multiply this by this solution y by some large value k so that now all of these are integer. And look at the, uh, the multigraph described by that uh, blown up solution. Okay? Um, so Shikuri and Shepard showed the following nice property that if you take this graph g, you can find a collection of forests, f1 through fk, two properties. The first is that these pack into 2 times g, right? So the number of, you know, so, so, in, so in this uh, graph g, I had probably a bunch of parallel copies of a particular edge. And the number of times I'll use this multi-edge in my collection of forests will be at most twice this. And also, every pair that was k connected in this graph G will be in every will be connected in every single one of these forests. Okay. And notice that you know k connected here corresponds to being sort of one connected before I blew it up. Um, so in particular, every SITI pair in my original solution was one kind of one fractionally one connected. So there will be k connected in G. So this is just saying that each of these FIs is really a solution to this Steiner forest problem. Okay. So this immediately you know, gives you, uh, you know, a bound of two on the integrality gap, because I, I just imagine picking one of these FIs uniformly at random. Well, given that the, these things pack into twice g, it's expected cost is at most uh, twice the cost of my fractional solution. Yeah. So isn't this equal to an integral data form? Uh, so this is stronger. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll explain exactly why. Um, so, the, so, so yeah, so the expected cost is at most twice the fractional solution. And yeah, like there's a solution, so, so okay. Good, so uh, it's a good question. Isn't, isn't this the same thing? Uh, not quite, um, just because I'm requiring here that uh, I have k of these forests. Okay, so this is not an, like an arbitrary uh, uh, packing of forests. It's a packing of precisely k forests. So this is called the approximate integer decomposition property. But you could choose k. Um, okay, well, I could choose k, but it's the same k here and here, right? Uh, so. So, I mean, let me put it this way. So, so, so if, if, if this 2 was not 2, but it was 1, right, this would imply, this would imply that an integrality gap was 0. But it would also be a bit stronger. It says something like, uh, so, so the integer decomposition property says, well, if I have a, a fractional point, and I blow it up so that it's integer, I can write that as a sum of, yeah. If I blow it up by k to the integer, I can write that as a sum of k integer points in the polytope. So this is slightly stronger than uh, saying a polytope is integer. But it's very close. So, uh, okay. so indeed, right, so, so, so what our starting point was, was we would like to extend this theorem to the prize collecting set. Okay, so what would that look like? Uh, so this is what we optimistically hope. So I give you a multigraph G, some integer K. Uh, do there exist forests F1 through FK, which again pack into 2 times G? Is there? Yeah? You okay? We're good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Sorry? Stop me if there are any questions. Um, so the forest pack into 2 times G, and now we don't require that, I mean, not every pair has to be connected anymore. So before I said, well, every pair that was K connected should be in every single forest. Now I'm, it's a more general condition. If U and V are R connected, where R is some value less than K, what I'm going to require is that U and V are disconnected in at most 2 times K minus R of these forests. Now if R is equal to K, then this is just saying they're always connected, as before. But if R is less than K, then this says we can sort of double the sort of 
fraction of the time that they are not connected. So again, if this 2 was not there, and if this 2 was not there, this would kind of give you a 1 approximation, because if I sampled one of these forests, the probability that a particular pair was disconnected is exactly as what the, the LP value says. But here we're allowing that to double. Okay, so the probability of being disconnected will be, uh, will be twice as big as the LP fractional value, so we'll pay twice as much in expectation in the penalties, and twice as much in expectation in the cost of the set of edges. So, excuse me, one question. I don't remember. For the standard three case, mm -hmm. is something like this true? Uh, for what? For standard what? three. For this LP? Is the price collecting for uh, standard three? Uh, for price collecting, I mean, this uh, is standard decomposition. Uh, uh, um, you know, I kind of remember. I think it's so. I'm going to bring it back. You okay? Do you remember? It's yeah. true. Yes. Yeah, that was right. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, so for all of these TI, yes. Uh, and that's something you can get from. Uh, uh, what were we I think I remember splitting off was one way to see how it's splitting off. And uh, I think I think there is yeah, there's a there's a known theorem that basically gives you that immediately. I forget the name, but I think it's a chicken mm, shepherd. I think it's something else, but let me let me think about that. Um, so good point, yes. So this is true, very good point. This is true of all of the TJs. If, if, if it's price collecting standard tree, and so the only connectivity you care about is to a single root, then you can do this. Uh, so then this V would just be some fixed bar only. So again, like you know, going back to this, uh, the, the sort of optimistic conjecture we hope for is sort of true here and true here. Okay. Um, and again, if it were true, well, it would have implied an integrality gap of two. So. Clearly, it's not true, and that's in, indeed uh, was, was what we figured out. So, so this is false, and then, well, the integrality uh, gap lower bound is a bit more complicated than the counterexample to this, but it's uh, very much uh, inspired by it. So let me show you why this is not true. So again, so we want. Uh, so we're given a graph, we're given k, we want k for us to pack into 2 times g, and the, the number of times you're disconnected is at most twice uh, sort of k minus r, where r is the connectivity between you and me. And the graph. I'll say it again on the example. So here's the starting point. I'm going to start off with just the Peterson graph. Um, it's not really that crucial that it's the Peterson graph, but it's nice to draw, and it's what we will need is that it's three regular and three connected. Okay. Next step is I'm going to just subdivide uh, all the edges of this graph, and then I'm going to take this whole thing and I'm going to hang it off every single degree two node, um, and I get this. Okay. So notice, firstly, you know, we have a lot of guys that are three connected. So if I take two guys, you know, two of the degree three nodes in the original part of the construction, two of these guys, they're three connected. And if I look at any one of these small copies and I pick any two of the degree three guys, those are three connected. And then everyone else is two connected. Okay, okay good. So I'm going to pick k equals to three. So if this optimistic conjecture was, were true, it would say that, well, I can find three forests, F1, F2, F3, where any of these pairs that are three connected should be connected in all three of the forests. Okay. And every other pair should be connected in at least one of the forests, right? Because uh, the connectivity was two, so the sort of proportion of the time you were disconnected is like a third. We get to double that, so you can be disconnected two thirds of the time. You should still be connected in one of the trees. Okay. So that's what we want to show for the counterexample. So suppose I have f1, f2, f3. They pack into two times g, so that just means every edge is in at most two of the forests. 
Um, all three connected vertex pairs are connected in every forest that show that there are some pair of vertices that are disconnected in all of them. So let's prove this. So the first step, I'm going to zoom in onto one of these little uh, copies of the construction. And uh, the first the claim I'm going to make is that for each one of these bars, F1, F2, F3, when I look at it just on this piece here, there's going to be some vertex which is isolated, an isolated vertex in that forest. Okay? That's the first thing. So in other words, yeah, I mean, so here would be a forest that has no isolated vertices. Well, it's going to be basically a tree in this part. Um, it should be a tree because, I mean, all of these degree three guys need to be connected to this degree three guy. Um, so here, yeah, so here I have no isolated vertices. I want to show that's not possible. So firstly, let's look at, uh, so if I, if I look at this forest, imagine a tree, well, really, this part is just a tree. Let me imagine just getting rid of these uh, sort of edges, pendant edges that end at the two. I'm, I'm, I'm yes. confused. If, if there is an isolated vertex, why is that isolated vertex uh, connected to the, to the top vertex? It's not, but sorry, I meant to say, so the degree three guys, are not going to be isolated here because this degree three guy has to be connected to this degree oh, three oh, guy. It's, every it's, a, it's a degree two guy. Okay, but it's, it's, it could be. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So this vi yeah. would be maybe yeah, like this guy. Good. Good. Nice. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So here in this F1, if this was my F1, then every single one of these guys is not isolated. I want to show this doesn't happen. So imagine, let's look at F2. But now I'm looking at F2 and I'm, I'm getting rid of. I mean. F2 probably had some edges like this, right? Where this was a leaf. Okay? I'm going to throw those away and just look at what's left, and now I'm going to call T2. Okay? And so T2 is basically just a spanning tree of the Peterson graph before splitting it up. Okay? So it's a spanning tree uh, contained inside F2 of the, of the Peterson graph. So like, pretend these degree 2 nodes were not there. Okay? So that's T2. We'd look at the same thing for F3 and look at a spanning tree of the Peterson graph contained in it. This blue thing. And look, okay, I did it in this, I, did, I picked some example and I, I had some edges that were contained in both, right? In both of these spanning trees. That's clearly always going to happen, right? Because, well, I have 15 edges in the Peterson graph and each of these spanning trees, so again, just forget about these degree two nodes, they're gone. Each of these spanning trees has nine edges, so just by counting, they have to overlap three times. Okay. So if I look at this edge here where they overlap, well, I'm using both of these edges twice, so there's no space left for the edge in uh, F1. Okay. So this, this would be a, an option for V1. Okay, so that's so good. All right, so now, uh, now let's zoom out again. And if I apply the same argument in the zoomed out graph, there's going to be some uh, edge E1 here, where this sort of small copy over here is kind of isolated. Like neither of these two edges is in F1. Okay, the same argument on the zoomed out graph. And there's also going to be some guy over here, which is isolated in F2. Okay. So that means that if I look at some node inside of here and some node inside of here, the only possible tree that uh, forest that could contain both of them, that could connect them, is, is the third one. But what do I do? Well, I just pick inside of here, I pick a guy who is isolated in F3, and I'm done. So that works. So this optimistic conjecture is false here. So again, I mean, this doesn't quite prove the integrality yet. And let me say what, I mean, it's, it's close, but not quite. So, so again, to get the integrality gap, we do have uh, this uh, equivalence that says, well, um, 
So for a fixed instance, um, and, a, and some feasible LP solution, we're within an alpha factor of the optimal solution, I mean, up to within an alpha factor of our LP solution, for every single, every choice of class, right? Plus and penalties. That's if and only if you can sort of pack uh, some fraction of some, some integral solution. So that there exists some random forest F uh, for which, well, the probability that you're in should be at most alpha times the fractional value. So again, if this was one, you would be paying only out, only the LP value. And here, the probability that you're disconnected in F should be at most alpha times the fractional probability you just get. Okay, so this is the same as this jacquery shepherd thing, except that in the jacquery shepherd thing, this distribution would be, uh, the size of this distribution would be kind of small. So, um, so we just have to sort of extend to like, there cannot be some more complicated, bigger distribution that, uh, that works. So we have to change the construction a little bit. Um, let me just say how. So firstly, we'll just replace this Peterson graph with some much bigger three-connected, three-irregular graph. Okay. Um, so that will help because, I mean, if you think of that counting argument where uh, we were looking at uh, say two, two spanning trees of the Peterson graph, they overlapped in three edges. If you pick a much bigger three regular three connected graph, then they'll overlap in a larger fraction of the edges. And the bigger you make this, that fraction will go to uh, two thirds, I think. The next thing I'm going to Instead of splitting the edges of this piece of graph once, we'll split it n times. Well, again, n is large. Right, so, so just stick one node in the middle of the whole bunch, which, can't, uh, which is convenient just because it means that, well, uh, basically, for almost all of the nodes on this path, if I look at a uh, a useful forest here. I mean, it could be that I have a leaf here, but not many of these guys are going to be leaves, right? Because most of the time, if you're just if you're a guy in the middle here, if you're disconnected, uh, you're, you'll have neither of these adjacent edges, and if you are connected, you'll have both. Okay, just a few guys might might be leaves. So that's sort of convenient because it means you use up kind of a lot of capacity to connect this guy. Use both adjacent nodes. And finally, nest this construction not just twice, but many, many times. And somehow, you know, each time you nest it, somehow your connectivity to some root that you pick in the instance will get worse and worse and worse. Um, and then this was sort of implicit in what I said before, but I mean, you can always just pick every pair of terminal, every pair of nodes to be a terminal pair because I mean, it doesn't it doesn't cut us. So the construction, I mean, the LP solution we look at is going to have value one third on all of the edges in this big multi-layer graph, and then the value of z that I pick is just uh, just the, the smallest it can be. So so guys that are three connected. Uh, will get a z value of 0, so they have to be connected. Guys that are 2 connected will get a z value <coughs> of 1 third. And uh, so one just has to uh, show you know, this slightly more general version of the earlier statement. So, um, so now I want to prove not just that 2 is impossible, but that really that 9 over 4 is better than 9 over 4 is impossible. So so again, the probability that an edge is in my random forest should be, uh, I want to prove it. I cannot get a forest such that the probability an edge in the, is in the forest is smaller than, slightly less than 9 fourths times its LT value. And the probability that 
two guys are disconnected is at most slightly less than nine fourth times it's not be bad. Okay, if I can show we can show that no such forest exists. We're done. Um, okay, so I think uh, I won't say too much uh, more, but it's it's really the same uh, idea as I said uh, for the for the other case, just uh, slightly more subtle. Okay, um, let me just finish with two quick remarks. So one is uh, the same sort of construction. Also, is, is something if you if you're interested in Lagrange multiplier preserving uh, bounds, so that means that. Uh, you, you have a stronger requirement that you want uh, not just that the cost plus the penalty is at most beta times the LP value, but the cost plus beta times the penalty. So you kind of don't lose anything in the penalty here. Uh, so this is a stronger requirement that's often of interest in these sorts of problems. And so the same sort of construction shows that you cannot do better than four here. Whereas so for price collecting Steiner trees, so Gomez Williamson shows us a proof of two. And then it says a bit separate, but uh, uh, we also give an example for the price collecting Steiner tree problem, where there's an extreme point solution which has at most one third everywhere. It just shows shows you that uh, sort of the Jane style iterative rounding. Uh, Cannot achieve better than three even for price collection. So that's that's uh, not related to the other construction. Okay, and then uh, just open questions. So as I mentioned, that sort of we don't seem to have really good tools for working with <coughs> these low bound constructions. Um, I don't really know of a, a candidate stronger LP for this problem. At least the price collecting. And uh, yeah, the best upper bound we have is still the 2.54 of Hedger, Guy, and Jane. Um, we'd like to sort of understand this LP better and, and see if we can close this gap further. All right, thank you.